just before I get started, I want you to turn to the person next to you and ask them this question. What does it mean to be spiritual? I wonder what sort of answers you came up with. Well, as we ponder that, let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this, uh, this book of Nehemiah, full of challenges, full of, uh, full of learnings. But Lord, thank you that in and through it all, you are displayed in your strength, although sometimes in your withholding. So Lord, we pray today that uh, as we come to approach these words once more, that you will uh, open our hearts, open our minds and transform us to become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I wonder what your holiday tradition is. For Ali and myself, I thought back over the, uh, the holidays we've had, the, no, not the little ones where you get away for a weekend, but uh, the substantial ones. And it occurs to me that our tradition consists of two main things, travel and sport. On our most recent uh, holiday, we travelled and our hope was that we would see a game of cricket in England. Of course, they were all booked out by the time we got there. So, you know, that was, uh, we didn't come home depressed, but it was one of our hopes when we went. And our last big holiday before that, we travelled to Liverpool in England to see the Netball World Cup. Uh, Ali is a, uh, quite the netball nut and... Uh, It was actually a really great time. Are you getting the picture? You get to know who we are. Even when we travel and there is no sport, we find some sport to watch on TV instead. Now, there are lots of ways that people celebrate their holidays. But one way I have never heard of people celebrating their holidays is by getting everyone together and everybody stands up and somebody reads the Australian Constitution. not saying it doesn't happen, I've just never seen it. However, it seems like a really good idea to Nehemiah and to the people of Israel as they complete that wall. So last week we heard that that wall around Jerusalem, it was finally completed. And the next month was a holiday for Israel. It was a day where they were together together and actually Sabbath together. It was part of the uh, Levitical law. So the people got Ezra in that context. Ezra was a high priest, a teacher, and he was, he was to stand up in front of everyone and read out the scriptures for them, their law. Now, it's an, obviously an important historical detail and gathering for Nehemiah. But Why? Why was it so important to him to be part of that? I mean, after all, he came to rebuild the city. He came to rebuild the walls, and it was done, finally. Chapter 7 talks about the people moving in and showing how it really was the genuine people of Israel who were moving back to that place. The job that Nehemiah was asked to do, or actually came to do, was finished. So why didn't he just move on back to Susa? back to the king's palace, resume his service there. There was a Greek historian in Nehemiah's time. His name was Thucydides. And he made the statement that it was the people who made a city, not the walls. And I wonder if Nehemiah must have reached the same realisation because he knew that to rebuild Jerusalem wasn't just a matter of protecting the people, providing a place for them to be, but indeed helping them become God's people again. And if that was the case, Nehemiah would have been wrapped at the people's suggestion that Ezra stand up and reread the law for them, something that they had virtually forgotten. They hadn't seen it read for probably for a whole generation. Now, it's one thing for people to gather and sit there and listen to the Bible being read. But here it is the people who sit down and they ask Ezra, the high priest, to read it for them. Which he very happily does. 
because Ezra loved looking into the scriptures and finding God there himself. Not only does he read it, the Levites, the priests to the people, explain the reading as he goes so that they can be easily understood by the people hearing them. And they do understand and they respond to God. Firstly, they respond in tears. Remember, the listeners were 70 years on from where the exile took place. They may have heard very little of what had gone so wrong, that God would allow them to be taken off into exile, wondering how do we get to this point. But now they've seen God at work, blessing the project, keeping them safe, and drawing them together again as a people. They want to know more about him. They want to know more about this God who has done so much for them. But when they understand who they rejected, they are struck to the heart. It's almost like they couldn't believe they could possibly do that as God's people. And so they grieve that they have let things get to that point where the God who would give his blessing also would remove it because Israel had removed themselves from God. Nehemiah lets that go for a little while. But finally he tells them to snap out of it. He actually tells them to rejoice, to celebrate, to eat and drink well, to throw a party. Because as much as the people could see how much they grieved God, clearly God has blessed them in turn to turn it all around. The promises that God would withdraw his blessing if the people turned away from him were just a fraction of the blessings that would flow back to the people if they would turn back to God. Read what Moses had said to them back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 5. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you and you take them to heart, Wherever the the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you've been banished to the most distant land other than heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He'll bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you'll take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. Moses spoke those words we find in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30 nearly a thousand years before this time. God hadn't rejected the people of Israel because they rejected him. It wasn't a mutual disagreement. God had kept his promise to take away that protection and blessing, but still with deep, deep care, with deep, deep love. They were his children who had gone off the rails but they were still his children. And so as they read these words of blessing when they returned to God, it would have rung true that once again, God had kept his promise. They were absolutely safe and blessed and would grow again back in the land that God had given them, just as he had promised. In fact, they will be even stronger more prosperous and more numerous than all of their ancestors. The next day, all the people fronted up again. But it wasn't so that the priests could tell them what was in in God's law again. They did so because they wanted to respond practically to what they'd heard. They wanted to follow what the scriptures said, showing God their acknowledgement of bringing back Uh, acknowledgement that he had brought them back into the land under his promise. So they have the Feast of Booths, the Festival of Booths, basically a great big family camp. 
As it turned out, the fact that it was this particular celebration from the scriptures was entirely appropriate. If you go back to Exodus 23 and Leviticus 23, you would find that this celebration was celebrating God's power and mercy in bringing the people into the land that he gave to Israel. It was a feast to celebrate that God had given them a new home where he would grow them as his people. It was true of those people who entered the land after they left Egypt, but it was equally appropriate to those who'd been exiled, who had returned back from being slaves and exiles in Babylon, then Persia. And again, it was God's hand that had done it. God had come to them once more, rescuing them from their oppressors and even their own sin. The final thing that they would do in the next chapter was to confess their sins. Rather than telling God how wrong he was to deal with them so harshly, they pray to God and they say, as we look at the scriptures, we see how it was entirely our fault that we found ourselves in exile. We turned our back on you, not you on us. We did, we deserved it, and we are so sorry and so grateful for the mercy that you have shown us. Thank you. So as we come to the end of our series on Nehemiah, there is so much more in these chapters and what comes afterwards. But let me just pull out perhaps one main point that comes out of those chapters. And it really is this, that as much as being a Christian is physical, following God with our bodies and and what we do, it is profoundly spiritual. You see, Nehemiah Nehemiah knew that even if the walls were strong and the city safe, it still wasn't really going to be God's city. It might look nice, even eventually flashy, but that was what it was before. In fact, as you look back at the days of Judah before the exile to Babylon, the Bible talks about some of those kings as really terrible. But from the outside, the historical record is that at that time, they were some of the best times when Israel looked the strongest, even if the king was rotten. Nehemiah knew that even if Jerusalem looked solid, it was still fragile unless they sought God first. They sought his will. They sought to love him and obey him with their whole heart. But it's not just true of cities like Jerusalem. It could be equally true of us. We can look as if we're going great, as if everything is going fantastic for us. We might have the financial stability, the great job. We might have a secure retirement, uh, the happy family, the best technology on the market although it may not be such a good thing sometimes, and even pretty good physical health. And we might be doing plenty of good Christian stuff, helping out on Sundays with services, kids' church, welcoming other things too. It might be even things like uh, being involved with Bible studies and other kinds of things. We can use all the right Christian words almost as well as one of those lovely greeting cards from Kurong. But... If we are not strong spiritually, we're not really strong at all. In fact, Jesus was really scathing at people like that, the Pharisees of his days. He even called them whitewashed tombs. They look pretty, but they're actually dead inside. Instead, he urged the people to be spiritual, to turn their hearts back to God and to follow him. To be spiritual people filled by his spirit. In fact, one of the interesting things about this period in Israel's history is the timing. Because here with Nehemiah, he talks about the festival of booths. But in the New Testament, that festival had a new name. Pentecost. But what does that all mean? Doing amazing spiritual stuff like healing people or speaking prophecies from God or finding parking spaces in busy streets. I really did have a friend who thought they had the spiritual gift of parking. Maybe. 
but possibly not for most of us. For most of us, it will be what the people did in Nehemiah's Jerusalem. The first thing they did was was gathering together to encourage one another in their faith and to bring themselves before God. In Western society, our emphasis is often being on the individual, being unique, proving your own personal value. But I think God put Israel in the East for a reason. Because in a place like Israel, in the eastern part of the world, it was a people where people see themselves not as an individual, but as part of their community. And he knows we are stronger together, upholding each other, continuing to keep loving and following God together. So gathering together is a big part of it. The second one, we need to want to know God more. The people in Jerusalem didn't stop at knowing that God had blessed them, saying thanks and then turn around and go home. They went to the priest to ask them more about what the Bible says. They hungered to know more, not just to fill their head with knowledge about God, but to fill their hearts with knowledge of deeply knowing God. Not just knowing knowledge, but to fill their hearts with, uh, with love for him. To be able to worship him more fully with their lives. Faith in Jesus was never supposed to be a steady state of being. As I said before at the beginning of the service, we should always be being built as God's people. It's supposed to be an adventure to be a follower of Jesus as God reveals more and more of himself to us. So we will thrive if we keep growing in our knowledge and love of God. Number three, allow yourself to be moved. When I was 16 years old, I heard someone give a talk and for the first time, I understood the price of my sin, the seriousness of it and my guilt. Suddenly I understood what Jesus had done for me by dying on the cross and being raised to life again. I knew both my guilt, but also my freedom from it all because of Jesus. And I wept. I was moved to tears. Now, we can often be cautious about letting our emotions get the better of us, letting our tears escape. It's a little bit scary. But the scriptures weren't written by people with hearts of stone. They rejoiced. They wept. They were in absolute awe of the things that God had done. We're supposed to be moved. It's supposed to hit us like being hit by a thunderbolt sometimes. So let God do that for you. Let him move you in uh, deep within. Number four, celebrate your faith. Ali grew up in Victoria. And uh, her clear recollection of what it meant to go to church and to believe in Jesus was guilt. Every time she went to church, Jesus was still there on that cross as a reminder of all that was wrong about her and all the wrong that she'd done. But if you look at that cross behind me, Jesus is no longer there. He's been raised to life again, knowing that sin was serious enough that Jesus had to die tells us of our need for a saviour. But we should celebrate God's love and mercy that raised Jesus to life again and gave us life through him, life forever, life abundantly. That's something to celebrate. This should look like a party every Sunday. Remaining dead in our sins was never part of the idea. So have joy as you live the life that Jesus has given you. And do live it to the full. And number five, respond with action. Yes, Christianity is a spiritual reality. Christian faith is indeed something that should affect us deep within. But it also has those physical outcomes. We're not just to leave those to one side. 
How do we know God loves us? By remaining a mysterious being that we could never really grasp? Or by sending his son for you and me, for his humble yet so, so powerful life, for being prepared to die for us. In Jesus' teaching, the teaching of the apostles in their letters in the New Testament, they do sometimes talk about, in fact, often talk about what we believe in and how that might transform us. Maybe that could lead you into, uh, sorry, but, but also at the same time, many of them talk about action about things that our faith, what's happened deep inside us, should lead us to do in response to what, to what God has done for us. Maybe that might lead you into some kind of service, even greater service at this church, or maybe it will be with your family, maybe with your friends, or people you haven't even met yet. Our personal faith is not supposed to remain personal. People will see it more through our actions than our words. And that gives glory to God. And sometimes when our faith is lagging, sometimes those physical practices will help our spiritual selves to catch up as well. Are you a spiritual person? Will you let yourself become spiritual? Because it is something you have to work at. Nehemiah returned back to Israel 13 years after he returned, uh, had gone back to Susa. And he could see that some of those wonderfully spiritual people had backslidden and they needed to get back on track. It's something that we also need to commit to us, uh, for ourselves. We need to commit to being all the time. I would love to be the minister of a church full of spiritual people. And I know that many of you are. If you're not... If this morning might raise questions for you, I'm going to pray that you'll become so. And if you are, I'll pray that you'll continue. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you that you came to us in the person of Jesus. But Lord, you have been doing, you have been intervening in human history for so long before that. Lord, we thank you for Nehemiah. And all the things that he has to teach us about ourselves, about the, the nature of our relationship with you, about our trust in you, about our faith in your strength, first and foremost, rather than our own. Well, thank you that Nehemiah teaches us so much about prayer. That at every single step, he turned back to pray. Lord, we thank you for that example. Lord, thank you for the spiritual person that you made him, someone who was indeed full of your spirit, someone who knew what you had called him to do and he didn't hesitate to follow it. Lord, we pray that we also will be people who know you deeply, who continue to look at the ways in which you gather us together and, and be committed to that, because you, uh, you love us coming together and encouraging one another in our faith and in the good deeds that you would have us do. Lord, thank you for continuing to reveal yourself to us. May we be hungry to know more. May, you, may we allow ourselves to be moved by you. May we allow ourselves to be struck to the core at times just to bring home how much you mean to us. May we celebrate our faith. Just as you raised Jesus from the dead and brought great life, may, brought new life, may you also continue to teach us how to celebrate the, faith, the life that you've given us. And Lord, may we continue to respond to that day by day in our words and in our deeds and in, with everything that we have. Lord, thank you for this example. May we follow it. May you bring, create a spiritual, uh, your spirit within us uh, for those who do not know that yet. But Lord, may you continue to build your spirit within us. May he continue to lead us into greater growth, into greater love, 
And Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.